Welcome to Search the Scriptures. Yesterday in our study, we began in the book of 1 Kings at the 17th chapter, and in today's study, continued in chapter 18 and chapter 19. And this is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. It deals with one of my favorite characters in all the Bible, the character of Elijah. And there's some things that are in one aspect you just you just have to laugh at. Uh, poor Elijah, the things that he, he goes through, it's just interesting, the journeys that God takes us on. I guess I say laugh at it because I see sometimes myself and some of the things that I feel uh, as a minister of the gospel that Elijah went through uh, as well. We open up uh, in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17 looking at this guy and the very first words uh, that come out of Elijah's mouth in scripture are these. Uh, 1 Kings 17 in the first verse. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Wow, you talk about a pronouncement. It's not going to rain for a couple years. That's a pretty bold statement to make. And he makes this statement to bring about judgment upon Israel, to try to wake Israel up and get Israel's attention. He's prophesying really in the northern kingdom here. Ahab is on the throne. He has that wicked wife, Jezebel. And he says, hey, it's not going to rain for a couple of years. And right after he says that, right after God puts that word in his mouth to proclaim to the northern kingdom of Israel, God basically tells Elijah, you know, by the way, it'd be a good idea if you hid for a while. <laughs> so, so Elijah proclaims God's word. And rather than the altars being filled with people and him being put on the front of Christianity today, God says, yeah, by the way, go hide. And God has him hide out uh, by a brook. And it says that while he is, is there, that the, God commands the ravens to go and to feed Elijah. Now, that sounds pretty cool until you think about it. You know, what exactly are ravens going to bring him? You know, uh, maybe roadkill, maybe... <laughs> Maybe some possums have got hit by a few chariots. I mean, ravens are scavenger birds, and they go and they, you know, they get what they can find, and they bring it to Elijah. And I find what's interesting about about this story, why I just, I just have to smile, is that while he's there, and while there's still water in the brook, you know, I mean, it takes a it takes a while for a drought to have an effect. I mean, you proclaim it's not going to rain, immediately God says, "Go hide." And he goes and hides and, you know, it stopped raining, but there's still, there's still food on the shelves. There's still people taking stuff to market. Droughts take a while to have their effect. So while everybody else is still going to the market, while they're still going out the outback to have a steak, uh, they're still, while they're still going to the supermarket and the shelves are full, Elijah's hiding and he's eating leftovers that the birds pick up off the road. And it's when the brook dries up. When the drought finally has its effect, that God says to Elijah, hey, go into town to Zarephath and go to a restaurant. You know, go find this lady that is, is about to die and have her prepare you a home-cooked meal. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. It, it's what the life of faith is all about. It's what life and full-time ministry is all about. God's saying to, to Elijah, you know, I'm going to ask you to do things that aren't going to make any sense. And when you proclaim my word and you think you're going to be up on this mountaintop experience and all these wonderful things happening, I'm going to have you go hide. And then when it really gets bad, I mean, and you're the one that everybody's going to blame for the drought, when it's real bad, I want you to go into town and ask a lady that's about to die to cook you a meal. And that's exactly what Elijah does. This lady, he, he approaches her and he, he says, uh, look, I'm hungry. And she says, aren't we all? <laughs> and he says, yeah, but uh, you don't realize what I've been eating. I haven't had meals on wheels. I've had meals on wings and they haven't been very good. And I'd like a cake. And she says, well, me too. And he says, well, make one for me first. I mean, the audacity. But nevertheless, he says, make a meal for me first. And she says, but I'm getting ready to die. He says, I tell you what, if you take care of me first, then I can guarantee you that the oil and the flour will not run out in your household. And, and it doesn't. And I think that's something, sometimes something, uh, something that we miss in the Word of God that we're afraid to proclaim. We need to take care of God first, God's messengers first, God's kingdom first, kingdom business first, the things of God first. 
And our needs and everything else come secondary. And when we get it in that proper order, God makes sure that we are provided for as he did this widow lady. doesn't mean life's going to be easy. I mean, eventually this, this widow, her, her son dies. And, you know, she comes right at the prophet, the guy that made the drought in the first place, the guy that caused all the problems in the first place. And she says, now my son's dead. You can imagine Elijah. He's like, Lord, you know, when I went to Bible school, this isn't what I signed up for. I didn't sign up for all these difficulties and these problems. He takes this boy that's not breathing up on top of the roof and he stretches himself out over him three times and he prays. You know, I can just hear him praying, God, please, please let this kid live. And the kid did live and uh, there was victory there in that household. And then uh, God, you know, tells, tells Elijah uh, at this point, you know, I want you to go and I want you to uh, uh, have a meeting with Ahab and I want you to proclaim that it's going to rain. And I'm sure at this point he's saying, great, finally I can get out of this mess and finally I can get the credit that I deserve. And he goes and he finds a man along the road named Obadiah. Obadiah worked in the, in the palace of Ahab and he was the head of that. And there was this rampage on the part of Jezebel trying to kill all the prophets of the Lord. Yet this guy takes a hundred prophets and puts them in two caves, 50 in each caves, and he hides them out. And Elijah sees him on the road and says, by the way, I'd like a meeting with Ahab. And Obadiah is like, man, do you want to get me killed? Everybody's been looking for you. And now you just want me to waltz right in there and say, yeah, Elijah, I'd like a meeting uh, with you. Obadiah is interesting here. He's not concerned about Elijah's help at all. <laughs> He's concerned about his own help. He's thinking, I've already went out on a limb here. I've, I've hidden out prophets. And, you know, the word about that is bound to get around. And now you want me to tell him that you're in town. And what, what certainty that I have that the Spirit of God is not going to call you somewhere else tomorrow. I mean, you haven't been around for about three years. And uh, Elijah promises him, hey, I'll be there. I'll show up for the meeting. So they have this famous meeting on Mount Carmel the 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, and they meet on this mountain. And we all know the story, very familiar story. It's why we like the story of Elijah. Uh, these men, they're, they're, the showdown is this. We're going to build two altars. We're going to put two bulls on the altars, one on each altar, and we're going to call down fire from heaven. And whichever God answers, that's the God we're going to serve. There's not going to be any of this wavering between two opinions. Either the Lord is God or he's not God. Baal's God. And we're going to decide today uh, who is God. So the, the false prophets, they build their, he, he lets them go first. They build their altar. Uh, it says that they dance, they shout, they scream, they even cut themselves. Elijah's just making fun of them the whole time. He's, yeah, maybe, you're, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe your God's on a hunting trip. Uh, maybe you need to yell a little louder, dance a little harder. Uh, and so they just continue on and cut themselves. Finally, by evening, Elijah's had enough. He says, okay, that's enough. He builds his own altar using 12 stones to represent, the, to represent the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And he makes this sacrifice on the altar, pours, makes a trench around it, pours water all over the top of it. Water, not lighter fluid. Then he prays a simple prayer. And God answers from heaven. And fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice, consumes the wood, consumes the water, consumes the altar itself. And Elijah commands that they seize the prophets of Baal take them down in the nearby valley, and he has them all killed. And you think at this point, victorious moment, right? I mean, Elijah's going to be carried in in victory, you know, and everything's going to be great. Uh, it doesn't turn out quite that way. But before the bad news, uh, Elijah tells King Ahab, hey, hitch up your chariot, it's going to rain. That's a bold statement. Has it rained for three years? Now all of a sudden, it's going to rain. But hey, he made bold statements before, right? And maybe this one would get him a good meal, not one brought to, to him by ravens. So after he says this, I, I find it interesting here. He's got his head between his legs. <laughs> he's kneeling down with his head between his knees. And he's saying, oh, God, please send rain. And he looks, and there's not a cloud in the sky. And he prays again, God, please send rain. I mean, he prayed three times for a kid to be raised from the dead. And he lived three times. God, please send rain. Look, not a cloud in the sky. Pray seven times. Finally, he sees a cloud the size of a man's hand. It says that Elijah, the spirit of the Lord, comes upon him. And he outruns Ahab's chariot. And he gets back to Jezreel. 
you know, thinking he'd be welcomed as a hero. Not so. Jezebel is on a rampage. She promises to have him killed. You know, once again, he finds himself on the backside of the desert, finds himself under a broom tree, uh, finds himself uh, complaining. And, oh, God, he says, I just want to die. I just want to die. You know, sometimes in the ministries, preachers feel like that on Monday mornings. <laughs> they made this great proclamation. They think, man, everybody's going to be happy and joyous and excited about it. And then come Monday morning, they get up and they say, God, just kill me. God, just remove me from this occupation. And that was Elijah's prayer. And I, I, it's interesting here. I, I, it's as if God says, you know, yeah, we were kind of hard on this guy, having him fed by ravens. Maybe we should do a little bit better this time. Uh, and let, let, let's serve him some angel food. Literally, while Elijah's asleep, an angel comes, makes a meal. When Elijah wakes up, it's warm right there beside him. He takes that meal and God says, get your nourishment up, get your strength up. God continues to feed him. Then God sends him on a 450-mile journey to Mount Hebron. He gets there not to stay in a holiday inn, not to stay in a five-star hotel, but he gets there to stay in a cave. And while he's there in the cave, God comes to him and says, Elijah, what are you doing here, man? And Elijah just says, man, you know, Everybody's trying to kill me, and it's just awful, and life stinks, and I just wish I was dead. I mean, he just has this tremendous pity party. I mean, Elijah could lay out a spread in a pity party. And uh, the Lord says, I tell you what, man, why don't you just go hide right there, because I'm getting ready to walk by. And I, I just, I'm just going to walk by you for a moment and maybe let you get a glimpse of me. And it says that God hides Elijah there in the in the rock, and God, God comes by, and there's he, there's a fire that breaks out, there's a wind, there's an earthquake, all this stuff happens. But God's not in any of that. God is in a still small voice, and that still small voice says, "Elijah, what are you doing here?" And Elijah he has a pity party all over again. Well, God, you know this. You call me to do something really hard, and everybody's trying to kill me, and it's just it's really, really bad and all that. You know, God gave him an opportunity. God passed by. God showed all his glory. And Elijah didn't get it. So after God asks him that the second time, and God gets the same response, this is what's interesting. God says, well, I'll tell you what, Elijah. You don't like this job? Why don't you anoint your replacement? Because I've got another guy who will do it. Wow. I mean, God replaces him just, at the, just like that. Because he didn't recognize all the strength and the glory and the power of God when God walked by him and God spoke to him with a still small voice. He didn't change his tune. I wonder how many times we don't change our tune. You know, how many times ministers like myself. We can have a pity party, not realize that in a moment of time, God can replace us. God said, you're going to go anoint Elisha, and he's going to take your job. And it's interesting when Elijah finds Elisha. Elisha apparently comes from a really well-to-do family. He's got it all together. There's 12 yoke of oxen that he's plowing with. And Elijah calls him into the ministry. Elisha goes back, kisses his mom, kisses his mom and dad, and says, and sets his oxen on fire. <laughs> he sets his, his uh, farm equipment on fire. He, he kisses the old life goodbye. Wow. Now, fortunately, this isn't the end of the story of Elijah. It goes on for a few more chapters and into the book of First Kings, and he's ended up hauled away in a chariot of fire. I mean, he's, he's redeemed, but wow, what a hard lesson to learn. Go and anoint your replacement. Now, when the glory of God comes into your life, we just need to embrace that and and we just need to stop our pity parties. And we just need to say, God, thank you. Thank you for the calling. Thank you that for all the opportunities that you've given me. Thank you. I love you. I care about you. And I worship you. I hope you're having a great day today. I hope this study in First Kings 17, 18, and 19 has been a blessing to you. May God richly bless the rest.